I think you're really going to enjoy our next speaker. We, one of the things that has been so special about today has been hearing all of your voices, all of the stories that we've heard. We learn from stories. And our next presenter is going to tell you a great story. Ladies and gentlemen, please a big warm hand, please, for Calvin Newcomb. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, what an awesome day. I can't, I, I don't have enough good things to say about it. Um, the, the organizers, I know Lori personally, so thank you, Lori, for all the hard work you put in. Um, but I mean, obviously she's not alone, uh, but she's the one that I know that I can thank by name. So that's, uh, but, but thank you to everybody who's doing this. Thank you to the students, because as I understand it, it was you wanting to be here. That was the criteria for coming here, right? So having a group like this that came because you want to be here, that, that means everything. As opposed to people who just have to go because the teachers tell them to or something like that. Um, so to wrap up uh, this day, it's really an honor to have been invited to come and tell my story to close this day out. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I call my story Meet Calvin. I am Calvin. Uh, this is my website if you're interested in uh, the other work that I do or videos and my talks. Um, so I am here to tell you my story. And um, however much fun it is to talk about oneself, this isn't just shameless self-indulgence, okay? I've actually tried to find a moral or two to my story so that we can benefit from more than sheer entertainment value. For one thing, you might find your awareness a little broadened by meeting somebody who's so different that he actually appears normal. Hmm? Welcome to the world of things turned upside down. But before I begin my story, I'm going to skip straight to the end and tell you what the morals of my story are. For those of you whose attention span is just to it to run out. First, people are no different despite their differences. Second, be happy. And finally, however much it feels otherwise at times, life is good. And quality of life is even better. That's what I'm here to communicate if I can. And over the course of the presentation, I hope that you'll be reading between the lines and recognizing what's at the heart of all of this, which is self-acceptance, self-confidence, loving yourself, loving your neighbor, having integrity, and most importantly, having a sense of humor about it all. Um, and so now you are free to tune out safely without missing much more than a massively entertaining story expertly illustrated by me in pen and ink without instructions. <laughs> so first let's go over the basics. Um, this is my family. I have a beautiful wife, Sharon. I have four even more beautiful little children. Heidi, Beatrice, Betty, and Gérard Mambo Petit Chat. He's French. <laughs> I am a female to male transsexual. And yes, from time to time, I pick my nose. <laughs> but you know what they say, I was born this way. And it's true, I was born wrong. <laughs> but that's not easy for me to talk about. So. If you can see past the glare, you'll also notice that I was born a girl, and that's where my story begins. Uh, I was born a bald baby girl. Uh, you can see that I took a little liberty in my recreation of the event. My parents named me Caitlin Joanna. Caitlin meaning pure, and Joanna meaning God is gracious. And I'm grateful to my parents for the names that they chose for me, but I'll tell you it's hard to live up to a name like Pure. It's a relief to hear that God is gracious. I chose the name Calvin, which means little bald one. I didn't know that when I chose it, but that's, that's the truth. Uh, that's a name I can live up to, and I already have. Um, after my middle name, I chose Jacob, which means usurper, one who usurps. I thought it fitting, considering. And I was also born a Christian, or more specifically, a Mennonite, which is both a cultural identity 
and a conservative religious tradition defined by simple living, hard work, community, faith, and fierce pacifism. Usually, in Mennonite upbringing, you find fairly rigid male and female gender roles and boundaries. For example, I was raised in a church where many women covered their heads, and where women weren't permitted to speak or to have authority over a man in a religious sense. So I suppose that I was particularly fortunate that my family wasn't overtly concerned with gender roles and boundaries. Um, even though my mother was a housewife and my father led all the prayers and other such traditional stuff, my parents were free thinkers and raised me to be the same. My mother, for example, believed that a woman has the right and the freedom to dress and act according to her preference. And so, according to my preference, I dressed and acted more or less like a boy, and my mom just took it as one of the many ways in which a female is free to express herself, which, of course, it is. And my father was also not a slave to tradition. If his daughter wanted to play baseball, he would make sure that she kicks butt. But... <laughs> For him, the equality of the sexes was not absolute. He drew the line at females burping and farting, which I always thought was offensive in the extreme. He farts, I fart, he burps, I burp. But he wouldn't listen to logic. So, as I grew up, I may have been denied the male privilege of passing gas. I like to think that I'm making up for it now. <laughs> but. I was allowed to dress how I wanted, other than my awful school uniform, the dress, the blouse, the tights, and all of that. Um, and I could play baseball on all boy teams and kick butt if I do say so myself. They didn't call me killer for nothing. There was only one problem, which is that in my mind I knew that I was a girl, but I didn't feel like one. I knew that the normal thing would be for me to play with the girls, but I didn't get the girls, and the girls did not get me. Um, if we played house, I was assigned to be the husband and given the attic room in the tree where I was told to stay, which I was happy to do so long as I didn't have to play mommy and baby and plan marriages and things like that. Um, so I didn't even know what to do with Barbies and dolls, honestly. Yeah, like other than tying them up and popping their limbs off. Um, so mostly I played G.I. Joe and Ninja Turtles with the boys like any sensible person. Um, I call this stage of my life oblivious, and I remained oblivious throughout my childhood. But all that changed one day when my body changed, and I started turning into a girl for real. And at the same time, my friends all started turning into boys who liked girls, and that's when things started getting really complicated. The day when my best friend Thomas told me that I was a beautiful princess, I knew that the good old days were gone. This was a whole new ball game. This was puberty, and with puberty, I had to accept that this body of mine was determined to turn into a female one. And in my oblivion, I figured that I had no choice but to make a goal of being a girl. <laughs> the result, of course, was more or less ridiculous, as you can see in this carefully crafted dramatization. <laughs> I had no natural instinct for it. I call um, uh, this stage of my life clueless. I had no idea that there was an alternative to living as a female imposter, as it felt to me. Basically, I had no idea about anything. I was raised in the Mennonite tradition. My whole life was church and Bible study, Christian youth group, and private Christian school. And they didn't exactly teach sexual and gender diversity anywhere in those little bubbles. Um, my school didn't provide sex education. Um, I had skipped a grade where they teach biology and tell you what's what and why. <laughs> and um, I didn't have internet. So you can imagine how much I knew about bodies, sex, what's down there, and naughty stuff like that. <laughs> so puberty. Stuff started growing in all the wrong places, two in particular in front. Bras were eventually forced on me when my natural look evolved into inappropriate. 
<laughs> I think I wore the same one bra for almost 10 years, about equivalent to its natural lifespan from purchase to total erosion off of my body. Because there was no way you were getting me into a store to buy another. Puberty felt all wrong and completely unnatural. But however much it disturbed me to be suddenly bleeding once a month for five days for crying out loud. My apologies to anyone here who's as yet unfamiliar with the horrors of female puberty. <laughs> and however disturbed I was at growing a bubble butt in an hourglass figure, what could I do? I figured my only choice is to go with the flow, so to speak. feelings would pass, that this must be the experience of all women, I don't know. Um, but so for a while, the worst damage that my little dilemma caused was embarrassment for me and an eyesore for everybody else. But the feelings didn't go away. They grew stronger with time and with the experience of acting like somebody that I wasn't, which felt to me an awful lot like lying. Through no fault of my own, I had become a liar. A liar to myself and a liar to others. I was faking everything, every smile, every laugh, every gesture, every girly giggle or whatever it is that girls do in a girly way. Hiding from myself and from others erased me. And the damage that this caused was much more serious. Feeling like being a girl on the outside and feeling like a boy on the inside made me confused, sad, angry, and sick. I call this stage of my life unhappy. For years, I couldn't eat. And for years later, when I started eating again, I would throw it back up. I hated everything about me. My hair, my voice, my hips, my boobs. And since I hated my body, I hated myself. And since I hated myself, I hated everyone else. And since I hated everyone and everything, I hated life. All of that hate turned into violence. And instead of letting it out, I turned it inward, throwing myself on my own grenade of rage. I grew very thin from the starving and puking, and very scarred inside and out. I wanted to cause as much damage as possible to a body that felt like an enemy to me. I isolated myself from friends and family, but I put on a good show when it counted, so that I would get what I wanted, which was to kill myself or to die trying. And I'm telling you this because I think it's important that we speak honestly about these things. Suicide is all too real, and the cost of silence is all too high. By the time I was in university, I was a shell of a person floating through life under a very dark storm cloud. Most days, I stayed home and slept and starved and hurt myself. But once in a while, I would drag myself to my classes, where I would spend my time staring at the floor, fantasizing about curling up and falling asleep. Nothing had the power to awaken in me the will to life, until one day, as I sat perched on my pedestal of personal suffering, something changed. A face stood out of the crowd. A few years later, I married her. This, of course, is lovely Sharon, she who must be named because she's just so wonderful. Sharon was something completely different, and she woke me up. Sharon loved me just the way I was, though she thought I looked funny and didn't hesitate to say so. <laughs> it's a good thing that she reminds me often that she likes weird things. 
It was love at first sight, and from that moment on, we were a bird and a fish making a home together. I call this stage of my life happier. From our first conversation, Sharon had this funny notion that happiness is the most important thing. Sacrilege, I thought, selfishness. How could I justify putting my happiness first? Sharon thought that I was foolish to disagree, foolish to put my happiness last on my list of priorities. And it's taken me 10 years and counting to figure out why she's been right all along. When I was unhappy, nothing mattered to me, not even my own life. Happiness is restoring my life, just as unhappiness sucked it out of me. I'm amazed at how long it took for me to realize the totally obvious, which is that happiness leads to quality of life, while unhappiness leads to the opposite. Happiness is the most important thing because it makes everything, everything better. And because without it, all good things in life seem pointless. Um, so before I met Shannon, I was obsessed with being the person that I thought my family and friends and God, and in fact my own biology expected of me. And I was doing a terrible job of it, and I was miserable every step of the way. Falling in love with Sharon changed the course of my life radically in the direction of truth, love, and happiness. Hokey as it sounds, think about it. For the first time, I could love and be loved freely. I could be honest about myself without feeling fear or shame. I could enjoy life without feeling selfish. I could enjoy being alive. These are the things that I have been denying myself all those years of trying to be good and getting it all wrong. I should never have been so foolish as to think I was better off with lies and pretending than I was with the truth. A lot has changed in the 10 years that Sharon and I have loved each other. After all, when we first met, I was female and Christian and very closeted. And Sharon was female and agnostic and had only dated guys. And I picked my nose, and she thought that was gross. We couldn't have been more different. If our life were a movie, I don't know whether it would be a romantic comedy or a psychological thriller. <laughs> <laughs> the changes were gradual, beginning with the most urgent matter, in case you haven't noticed, of socks and sandals, <laughs> which is an offense that Sharon does not tolerate. That was the first thing to go, and the only change imposed by Sharon, because even her love isn't boundless, it stops at socks and sandals. So I corrected that, and I was right in Sharon's world again. And in the years that followed, I made some wardrobe changes of my own, because for the first time in a long time, it seemed possible for all to be right in my world too. But first, I had to come out technically as a lesbian, even though I never felt that that term applied to me. I simply told people that Sharon and I are so happy. Uh, a few years later, we got married, when it became legal for us to do so. Um, and that came with complications of its own. I mean, a wedding is bad enough as it is, but many people that we loved weren't there to share it with us. And after the wedding, just two weeks after we were married, um, actually, I came out finally as a transsexual. And let's hope it's finally. I think that my parents would be happy if they never hear we need to sit and talk ever again. <laughs> and then there were the hormones and the surgeries and all kinds of exciting stuff like that. With every step along the way, I was becoming more and more truthful and more and more comfortable in the body that I've got to work with and more and more happy. It was incredibly difficult to do. I was afraid. My fears ranged from, what if everyone rejects me, to, what if I'm completely insane? 
It was, it meant turning my world upside down. But it was upside down from lifeless. So, I judged the tree by its fruit, as the Bible would say, and transitioning felt awfully fruity to me. That's a joke, of course. <laughs> what I mean to say is that living in my body before felt rotten. Living in my body now feels delicious. It's obvious which fruit comes from a healthier tree. Not all of the changes were for the better. We all lost friends, family, and churches. There has been so much loss. Few friends have proved faithful. And I think we've all learned a lesson or two in loneliness. But, as my mom said, we're building something wonderful. And she's exactly right. That's what I call this stage of my life, rebuilding. And I figure that from here, the next and last stage of my life will be old fart. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that stage can last indefinitely. I am what I am. I spent most of my life refusing to accept that simple truth, suppressing myself, trying to be someone that I wasn't. And the results were disastrous. But with a little bit of truth, a little bit of love, and a little bit of happiness, I've discovered that anyone, even me, even you, can take whatever crap cards you're dealt and make a good play of it. Do the best you can with what you've got to work with. You don't have to be trans for this to apply to you. Accept what is, and then make it as good as it can be. Please don't waste time suffering needlessly. Don't settle for an unhappy existence. Make happiness your priority and fight for it. Defend it. Preserve it. Because your happy self is your best self. And since happiness and unhappiness are highly contagious, think carefully about which germs you're spreading. Life really is good. It's all there is in the end. Without life, there is nothing. Let's get real. Let's all be sensible and make the obvious choice. Choose life and quality of life. The happier each of us is, the better off we all are. I think that everybody here, everybody, everybody, will discover at some point that life doesn't always go the way you planned. And there will be times when it might not feel like life is such a sweet deal. So fight. Do whatever it takes. Be ruthless in your pursuit of quality of life for you and everybody else. And please, be smarter than I was. And don't forget that you can't have quality of life without truth, love, and happiness. Thank you so much.